Welcome to How to Write a Novel in 30 Days, Tips and Strategies from I.D. Russell. If you're wondering who the heck I am, I have written 25 novels, seven of which are published. I've written 22 screenplays, two of which were made into no-budget indie features. And when I say no-budget indie features, I mean no-budget indie features. I have completed NaNo every single year since 2010. Now, I do not write the standard 50,000 words for NaNo. I have either written as few as 60,000 words or as many as 180,000 words, anywhere from one to three books, depending on what I've planned. Yes, I've written three books in one month for NaNo, 180,000 words. No, I do not recommend anyone try that. It is hell. But with the proper preparation, and dedication, you can do it if you really want to torture yourself. So my writing philosophy, as opposed to some others, is outline, 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 outline. I think you get the point. I am not a pantser. I prefer to have a detailed outline when I start so that I know what I'm going to do and I'm not sitting at a screen thinking for too long about what should happen, but I know what's going to happen. And if you want to do a book in 30 days, my opinion, you need to have a sense of what you're going to do so you can do it fast. What I like to do when I start is to prepare a detailed outline. So I'm going to need an idea, have a plot, a structure for how I'm going to tell that plot, some characters, a theme, and then I'm going to get to an actual outline and then a first draft. So, where are you going to get your idea from? Is your idea just going to come out from the ether? Or do you have to wait for a eureka moment? There's a lot of mysticism around the concept of inspiration, and I think that comes from our historical perspectives. So the Greeks thought inspiration came from the muses. The artists would enter a state of ecstasy beyond their own mind and given the gods' thoughts. Early Christians and Hebrews thought inspiration was a gift from God and the Holy Spirit either through revelation, which was conscious, or inspiration, which was involuntary and without total understanding. Romantic poets felt they were attuned to divine or mystical winds. Coleridge described passive reception and natural channeling as he wrote The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and it was evidence of the work of genius. In John Locke's model of the human mind, inspiration is a natural association of ideas and a sudden unison of thought. Freud thought it came from the unresolved psychological conflict or childhood trauma. Jung thought the artist was attuned to something outside of the individual experience, like racial memory. Marx thought it came from the friction between economic levels and an unaware dialogue of ideologies. Class consciousness, that the writer was attuned to an external crisis. But here's the thing. Nothing exists in a vacuum. All the great artists who supposedly changed the game they were all influenced by a clear line of people before them. Picasso, for example, was influenced by Cezanne and tribal art. Van Gogh was inspired by Gauguin and Monet. Warhol by Duchamp and Jack Smith. Bits and pieces of everything around you is going to coalesce. For me, I suggest reading, watching movies and television, specifically documentaries. When you see a good documentary where the filmer allows its subject to talk, you can see a lot of human nature revealed. I suggest listening to music, listening to people talking, just observe the world around you and how people interact with each other. You can mine your past for stories too. But if you're still stuck, what are you gonna do? Well, you know what? Almost every single work can be broken down to its varied influences if you know where to look and how something was changed. It's not copying, and if you use a mechanical system you might just find the spark you need to get started. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about systematic inventive thinking. This is used in product development all the time. And there's five core components of this. So you can take an idea that already exists and try this process to break it down and find your own path. So the first step, subtraction, where you eliminate a core component, i.e. You take another idea and remove a piece. So if we're going to use Harry Potter as an example, you could say write a book like Harry Potter but without the school, which has been done numerous times. Unification. That's where you take one component and assign another job. 
So you take an idea and give something another role it wasn't designed for. Continuing on with Harry Potter, you can write a story where Harry Potter also happens to be a plumber. Multiplication, where you change one component in a counterintuitive way. You change one part of an idea in an offbeat way. So maybe Harry Potter is a mute. Division, where you divide along physical or functional lines and then rearrange it. So you can take an idea and change the form, but keep the general concept. So Harry Potter, but the wizard school is underwater and everyone else is a merman or mermaid except for him. The final core component of systematic inventive thinking is attribute dependency, where you change the internal correlations. You change how two pieces in an idea connect. So maybe Harry Potter, but he's not the prophesied hero, and Voldemort is after somebody else. So some famous examples of systematic inventive thinking, and I'm not suggesting that the writers knowingly did this, but in some cases, the influence is so startlingly clear that it's hard to imagine they weren't aware of what they were doing. Now, George Lucas had numerous influences when he made Star Wars, but the films of Akira Kurosawa were some of the strongest. The Hidden Fortress has been noted to be a direct influence on Star Wars, and you can see the structure of the movie very clearly if you watch them. A Fistful of Dollars with Clint Eastwood, the famous Western, was a complete location swap of the Japanese movie Yojimbo. It was so blatant that they were sued and lost. The movie is about a rogue who comes to town where there's two dueling gangs and he plays them off of each other. If you watch Yojimbo and then watch Fistful of Dollars, it's incredibly clear how all they did was take a samurai movie and translate it to the Old West. Superman was a sensation when released. Fawcett Comics tasked their writers to come up with Superman, but the secret identity is a kid. And that's what they did with Captain Marvel. Now, of course, the stories diverged from there, and Captain Marvel for a time was more popular than Superman. But the initial idea was a direct result of systematic inventive thinking. The book series Aragon was literally pitched as Star Wars with Dragons. 1984 by George Orwell can be looked at as an almost direct ripoff of Evgeny Zamyadin's We. In fact, George Orwell wrote a review of We a few years before right 1984. Not only could Twilight be looked at as having its genesis from Anne Rice, but Fifty Shades of Grey began as Twilight fan fiction. Her idea was, I'm going to take the characters of Twilight and change the story to be about BDSM and erotica. Now, it was changed further to be published, but that's how it started. In my own personal writing, the High School Hell series, which consists of Heart of Stone, Heart of Clay, and Heart of Flesh, were born by my desire to write a similar series to Twilight, but instead of going vampires and werewolves, to go with Frankenstein monsters. The initial idea came from taking something that was already out there and tweaking it. But my influences are varied, so the, my series was born for my love of 80s movies. So it's a dash of John Hughes high school comedies with some Mel Brooks and The Naked Gun. This is an example of how all of your own influences will come together, and while the basic premise of something might be similar, you can take it in a completely different direction that others might not think of. So we have an idea. Now we're going to need to have a plot and characters and theme. You don't have to do it in this order. This is just the order I'm choosing to go through it for this presentation. We need to know what's going to happen. Who's it going to happen to? Why is it happening? Where is it going to happen? And how is it going to happen? So according to Christopher Booker, there are seven basic plots. Others think there are nine. Still others say 36. But taking the seven basic plots, he outlines the first one being overcoming the monster, where a protagonist is set out to defeat an antagonistic force. Example of the Bond movies, Star Wars, Beowulf, Perseus. The next plot is the rags to riches plot. A poor protagonist acquires something, and that could be power, wealth, a mate, etc., before losing it and gaining it back after personal growth. And examples of that are Cinderella, Aladdin, Great Expectations. Next up, we have the quest, where the protagonist and their companions set out to acquire an object of importance and reach a destination. 
Along the way, they encounter challenges and temptations. Examples of this could be the Odyssey, Lord of the Rings, the Indiana Jones movies. The next plot is the Voyage and Return. The protagonist goes to a strange land, overcomes threats, and then returns with new experience. Examples of this could be Alice in Wonderland, Back to the Future, the Edgar Rice Burroughs Barsoom saga. We have comedy, which Booker describes as light and humorous character with a happy ending. They triumph over adversity through escalating confusion and conflict that's revealed with a major event. Examples of this could be Midsummer Night's Dream or, for that matter, any romantic comedy. We have tragedy, where a protagonist with one major character flaw makes a mistake which causes their undoing. Examples of this are Macbeth, of course, The Room, Citizen Kane. And the final plot Booker identifies is the Rebirth, where an important event forces the protagonist to alter their ways, usually in the good. Examples of this are A Christmas Carol, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Beauty and the Beast, Avatar. One thing that Booker doesn't like to describe as a full plot, but acknowledges the existence of, are, is mystery, where the outsider, sometimes, to an awful event, like murder, seeks to uncover the truth. And also, rebellion against the one, where the hero rebels against an all-powerful force that controls the world, and they can either surrender to or refuse to surrender to that force. Now, in the Theory of 29, this list is expanded. We have, in a brief examination, adventure comes to you. You go to adventure. The quest, adventure, pursuit, rescue, escape, revenge, the riddle, rivalry, underdog, temptation, metamorphosis, which is an outer change, transformation, which is an inner change, maturation, love, forbidden love, sacrifice, discovery, wretched excess, ascension, descension, the hero's journey, two characters interact, the milieu, which is a story that focuses on a setting, the idea, which is a question posed and answered, a story focused on a character or an event. Now we have a plot. We're going to need a structure. How are we going to tell the story we've chosen? Now you need to keep your reader interested because supposedly attention spans have dropped from 12 to 8 seconds since the advent of the smartphone, according to a Microsoft study. Now there is some dispute about this, but I think we can all agree there's so many other things for them to do that if you bore them in a book, they're not going to bother finishing it. So we've all seen Freytag's Pyramid in high school, junior high, to explain story structure. It's primarily focused on Greek and Shakespearean stories. Or we begin with the exposition, then we have some rising action, we had a climax, and then some falling action, and some denouement. Apparently, today's audiences have less patience for a longer denouement, so we see that falling off. This is a more modern story structure, the Fichtean Curve, where we have a series of minor crises constantly building up to a climax before a very fast falling action. You'll notice there's very little denouement. This keeps you going. Sometimes these crises can be as short as a single chapter. And the hook is that you want to know what happens, so you want to read the next chapter and the next chapter. If you've ever read Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, he ends each chapter on some kind of minor cliffhanger. It might be something as simple as, and then they opened the door, and you want to know what's on the other side, so you want to keep reading. And whether or not you think that book is good or not, it has a tendency to keep you going, and you want to keep reading, keep reading, and keep reading. It never bores you. The classic hero's journey model, which is usually used in fantasy, sci-fi, or horror, begins with the hero in a known world, and then there's a call to adventure. They accept the call. Then there's some rising action in a moment of defeat, death, and rebirth, which leads to an atonement, a journey home, and the creation of a new normal. George Lucas, when he made Star Wars, was obsessed with Joseph Campbell and directly used this model to write the story. A more current structure is called the in media res, where you start in the middle, and this works very well for thrillers, mystery, or horror. So we start in the middle of a crisis, and then we have a series of flashbacks to build minor crises up to the climax, and then falling action and flashbacks before the resolution. The advantage of this is you start in the middle of the story and people want to know how we got there. There is a risk of doing this too often. You can sometimes 
try this in each chapter. So the chapter begins in the middle of the action, and you explain how you got there. But by doing this too frequently, you can burn out your reader because they just want to know what's going to happen next, not constantly backtracking. This is Sid Field's screenplay model that is used almost all the time in Hollywood now. Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Each of these points, when people examine scripts and talk about scripts, they will cite these points in the script as gospel. You don't have to follow this, but this is very popular in the screenplay world. Now we'll hear from Kurt Vonnegut. He had an idea of how all story could be plugged into a simple computer model. But I'm not going to explain it for him. I will let him explain it. Well, there's no reason why the simple shapes of stories can't be fed into computers. They are beautiful shapes. <coughs> this is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Here's the very middle. Now, this is the B-E axis. B stands for beginning. <laughs> e stands for electricity. <laughs> now, this is an exercise in relativity, really, is the shape of the curves are what matters and not their origins. So we'll start a little above average, is why, why get a depressing person? We'll start... <coughs> The whole thing, we call this story man in hole, but it needn't be about a man, and it needn't be about somebody getting into a hole. But it's just a good way to remember it. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. <laughs> they never get sick of it. All right, not copyrighted. Another story, also a beautiful curve and easily fed into a computer called Boy Gets Girl, but it needn't be that. Just a way to remember it. Start on an average day, average person, not expecting anything to happen a day like any other. Find something wonderful, just loves it. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> Got it back again. People like that. Now, these are beautiful curves, and this gets a little complicated. Is computers can now play chess, so I don't know why they can't digest this very difficult curve I'm going to draw for you now. And it so happens that this is the most popular story in our civilization, Western civilization. As we love to hear this story, every time it's retold, somebody makes another million dollars. You're welcome to do it. Now, Surprisingly enough, I've said it's depressing. You know, people don't like stories below, about below average days and people. But we're going to start way down here. Worse than that, who is so low? It's a little girl. What's happened? Her mother has died. Her father has remarried a vile-tempered, ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. You've heard it. <laughs> she... Anyway, there's a party at the palace that night. She can't go. She has to help everybody else get ready. She has to stay home. Now, does she sink lower? No. She's a staunch little girl, and she has had the maximum quack from fate, which is the loss of her mother. She, she can't go any lower than that. Okay, so the fairy godmother comes. Gives her shoes, gives her stocking, gives her <laughs> mascara. gives her a means of transportation, goes to the party, dances with the prince, has a swell time. Boring, 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 boring. Now there's a slight inclination to that line as I've drawn it because it takes perhaps 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a grandfather clock to strike 12. Does she wind up at the same level? Of course not. She will remember that dance for the rest of her life. Now, she poops along on this level till the prince comes to 
she fits, she achieves off-scale happiness. So, we're up to characters now. Do we create them before or after the plot? That's really up to you. There are two schools of thought. If you come up with the characters before your plot, you can come up with very interesting characters. You can do a lot of work describing their background and who they are, and then decide to put them up against problems to see what happens. But you can also grow too attached to them and become reluctant to cut them if they serve no dramatic purpose. If you come up with your characters after, you can use them to explore a premise and me or message or moral. They are there to illustrate different points of view or experiences or attitudes related to that. It's really just your own preference. My personal case study was I came up with the character of the Revengist. He is a tough-as-nails cop who's slightly clueless and hyper-violent, has some archaic ideas. He's a very strong personality. I find it interesting to see how would he react to this situation? How would this character, who doesn't necessarily think that women can do what he can do, react to having a competent woman as his partner? And that's book one. How would he react to having to save Prime Minister Trudeau from the Russians, whom he doesn't particularly like? That's book three. Once I have this character now, I start plugging him into other scenarios. So in The Killing Death, he's up against a serial killer going through an ancient Egyptian ritual. In some upcoming works of the Revengist, he faces other monstrous creatures. But because I have the idea of who he is, I can plug him into almost any scenario and see what happens. But I have also created characters to elaborate on a theme. The High School Hill series, I had a storyline first and came with the characters second. Characters and story goals. The hero versus the villain. So someone who wants to complete the goal versus someone who doesn't want them to. We have someone who wants to help them complete the goal or someone who wants to hinder them. We have someone who wants to get them to consider a course of action or someone who wants them to reconsider a course of action. We have someone who seeks a course or explanation based on logic versus someone who seeks it based on emotions. We have someone who exhibits self-control versus someone who appears uncontrolled. We have someone who appeals to the conscience versus someone who appeals to temptation. One who supports the efforts versus one who opposes them. One who expresses faith versus one who expresses disbelief. These are essentially the archetypes. So we have the protagonist who pursues or considers versus the antagonist who avoids or reconsiders. The guardian who provides help or the conscience versus the trickster or temptress who hinders and provides temptation. We have the reason character who operates on logic or control versus the emotion character who operates on feeling and is uncontrolled. Star Trek is a big one on this. Mr. Spock versus Dr. McCoy. We have the sidekick character who offers support and faith versus the skeptic character who opposes and offers disbelief. You can assign these functions whoever you want in your story if you are going to think of your characters as having functions. Two characters in the story that serve the same function can be redundant. It's up to you if you want to pursue that. And one character probably shouldn't have opposing functions unless you're going to elaborate on that as part of the story. It's generally not considered okay, but it's up to you. So who's going to be the main character? The main character is someone who should fulfill dramatic functions, is memorable, believable, and three-dimensional. You should have something that makes them stand out. It could be appearance, their clothes, their hair, their mannerisms, their speech habits, their smell, their facial expressions, the weird noises they make. Something that you can use that makes them seem like they are a person. You should keep their behavior somewhat consistent with their traits and background. If you're going to have a sudden reveal, it should be hinted at along the way. The murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie, where the ending, spoiler alert, the narrator turns out to be the killer. The first time you read it, you might be surprised, but if you go back and read it again, you'll notice hints along the way. Or in a more modern version, Fight Club. Some people were very surprised when Brad Pitt's character turned out to be a figment of Edward Norton's character imagination. But there are hints along the way, if you go back and look for them, once you know the answer. Giving your character a third dimension. What is the purpose of this character? What is the goal, the want, the need of them? What is their method? How do they act when faced with a challenge? How does this character judge people, situations, things, themselves, and their progress towards their goals? 
In other words, why are they the way they are? If you think about these, you will find a way to make your character three-dimensional and memorable. Minor characters in your story should be believable and consistent with the setting. They could serve a specific purpose or just be window dressing, but you should focus on details over just a generalized description. So rather than say the bellhop, you could say, you know, the gaunt bellhop, the gaunt bellhop with the patchy beard, something that makes you have an image rather than just a generalized description. And these minor characters can represent the theme and story goal. For example, in Star Wars, you'll notice the Empire is all uniform in appearance and accents. They're all white British men, whereas the Rebels are a more ragtag group and diverse, which elaborates on the story goal of fascism versus rebellion. When you're writing, you should consider the POV. Which character will be your narrator? If it is going to be only one character, you should only describe what they could know. You're going to want to think about who the best person is to tell your story. You could also use multiple points of view, like the Game of Thrones series. The theme. What are you trying to say with this story? What is the moral if you're going to have one? You have a declaration of the human condition, a truth that explains human behavior, principles, abstractions, or absolutes, some kind of universal idea. Is it going to be obvious or something for the reader to find out? It should still be there, even if you've never stated it. That's a personal opinion, and here's why. Having a theme helps to create an emotional connection to your story. It hooks readers in. It gives them something to think about after it's over. And it gives a purpose to the whole endeavor. And when you're writing, if you know your theme and you get stuck, that might be just the help you need to keep going. If you know what you're trying to say, it might clue you in on where you have to go next. I personally am big on themes. So in my own work, even if it's very silly genre stories, I still have a theme in mind in each story. So High School Hell, which is about a girl falling in love with a Frankenstein monster, the theme of that story is teenage love and how you create your image of somebody in your own mind. The Revengeist series, which is a tough-as-nails cop fighting drug dealers and ninjas and evil Mountie robots, might sound like the kind of story that doesn't have a theme, but it does. It's about a character facing up with the fact that he's becoming obsolete, that the world is changing around him. He's not sure if he still fits in. Everything in those stories relates to those themes, no matter how silly they might be. If you're not sure what your theme is going to be, just look at the main character. Who are they at the start and who are they at the end? How does the story change them? What are their flaws and how do they overcome them? Did they learn anything or not? There are lots of common themes out there that you can choose from if you want to. A quick Google search will give you a massive list. And here's just a few I curated for you. Things are not always as they appear or as bad as you think they will be. Beauty is only skin deep. Don't judge a book by its cover, which is just another form of beauty is skin deep. Mercy over judgment. People are the same across cultures. Believe in yourself. The power of believing in something bigger than yourself. People are afraid of change, yet the world always changes. Knowledge is power. Absolute certainty is impossible. Good over evil. Power corrupts. Bullies can be overcome. Greed and jealousy is bad, unless you're Wall Street. Treat others as you want to be treated. Kindness is its own reward. Love is blind. Friendship is the most important thing in life. Blood is thicker than water. Freedom and peace are worth fighting for. Personal responsibility protects. Growing up can be tough. Hard work can be its own reward. Courage in the face of fear. Actions speak louder than words. Never give up. Protect the weak. Happiness comes from within. Truth and the fool. Old age comes to us all. Etc. 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 Do a Google search and you can find even more. Some simple words that might clue you in on your theme. Ideas of alienation, ambition, betrayal, coming of age, courage, deception, discovery, escape, death, fear, freedom, good versus evil, isolation, jealousy, justice, loss, loneliness, love, lust, power, prejudice, security, spirituality, survival. Now the setting for your story. To have a great setting, you should probably do some research. You may want to draw maps. You may want to dive deep into Google and Wikipedia. Print out street layouts, room drawings, 
Figure out time period costumes, the food, the drink, the expressions of that era, the cultural differences. All of these can easily be found using Google. That's why I say Google is your friend. Use it as much as you need to. When I was writing The Revengist, the characters ended up in Russia and had to infiltrate the Kremlin. Now, I've never been to Russia. I don't know what the Kremlin is like, but using research, I was able to find not only videos about the Kremlin, but documentaries, maps, floor plans, tons and tons of images. And I was able to create an idea of how they would infiltrate this building just through research. I did not have to travel. So some personal examples of how I like to work. You can use some of these methods or you can ignore them. It's totally up to you. I usually begin with a series of notes. Whenever something pops into my head, whether I'm half asleep, wide awake, eating breakfast, on the go, I have a pen and paper handy and I write it down. It might be on a napkin, it might be on a scrap of loose leaf, it might be on the back of a bill, it's there. Just little scenes, maybe a line of dialogue, a character name, something. Once I feel like I have enough, then I move on. So this is an example of a three book series outline. So I've divided it into three columns, but this could easily be the three acts of a story if you're using the screenplay model. And I write out notes based on what I have already written. I've separated into what's going to happen in each book, beginning, middle, and end. Simple scenes, what should happen. Moving on to more examples of the way I do three book outlines at once. I will have in the, the line dividing it, the beginning, where the character is, what happens, and how they are at the end. And I might ask myself questions as I'm going, like well, how do they get where they have to go? There's arrows here that expand from one book to the other, showing you how the character has something that happens in the first book, which leads to a revelation in the second book, which leads to a resolution in the third book. Once I have that, then I do my individual book outline. So I write out all the scenes that I have. I like to start with the beginning and then the end and work my way there. So I write out a bunch of scenes and then the arrows show how they connect. And that gives me my story progression. This is another example of an outline that spans three books where I was writing out things that happened in one book and how they changed in each progressive book. So we have here, in book one, the main character saves a girl from drugs. In book two, she's living with him to get clean. Then in book three, she's killed by ninjas and he has to get revenge. You can see a clear progression and you can use this for acts as well. This is for me, it's entire books. In book one, there's a building under construction and there's a showdown versus a helicopter at the end. In book two, that building has its grand opening where a rich party is held. And then in book three, you find out that the mastermind of the entire plot is at the top of that building. So that story point progresses through all three books. Here's some more examples of outlines. Um, you can see how I write out scenes and then cross them off with arrows to show how you have to get where you have to get. You don't have to follow this. This is just my own personal way of working. Some people like to use cue cards. Some people write it out on the wall. Some people use giant maps. It's all up to you. Here's where I had to draw a map because I did not know how to explain the climax of this book. So the characters go to a drug lord's compound. So I drew out how the compound should be outlined, where they would come in and infiltrate the different buildings. That way, when I was writing, I had a sense of where everything was taking place. If you're moving on to stories that have multiple points of view, this is my personal way of doing it, where I have different columns for the different characters, some traits, what's going to happen to them in the story. And I give them a beginning, a conflict they have to overcome, and what happens at the end to those characters. So using that, extrapolating onward, I have outlines. I have each character in his own column, the series of events that happens to them, where they all interact, and what happens at the ending. The squiggly lines in the middle is where all these characters interact. So this is a scene where all these people will appear in different forms, but every other box is scenes where they are separate. 
And I've done three books like this, which had yet, yet to be published, hopefully in the future. So I have three examples getting more progressively complicated. Here's some famous examples of other authors. This is J.K. Rowling's outline from a Harry Potter novel. I believe it's Order of the Phoenix. You can see it's very similar looking. Here's Joseph Heller's Catch-22 outline, which is very complicated and very large, very, very detailed. But you can see how he had a clear sense of what he was doing before he started. And here's Norman Mailer. And this outline is a little bit after my own heart because it is incredibly confusing to look at. But obviously it makes sense to him. Now we have all this work going in. It's time to write a first draft. If you want to write a novel in 30 days, you need to have a sense of how much you're going to try to write. So if you're writing a middle grade novel, that's generally 20,000 to 50,000 words. Young adult novels are generally 40,000 to 70,000. Adult literary or commercial fiction is generally 80,000 to 100,000. Fantasy sci-fi is usually 90 to 120,000. Anything more than that is considered epic. Romance is usually between 50 and 100,000. Crime, mystery, thriller, or horror is usually between 70 and 90. The standard definition of novel is anything more than 50, but less than 110. And that comes from publishers who don't want something so short that people will think it was too slight, not worth their money, but don't want something too long that printing costs become unwieldy. So you have a sense of how many words you want to write based upon what you're writing. And you want to do this in 30 days. That means you have to do a little bit of math. If you're going to write 50,000 words at 30 days, that's 1,666 words per day. And if your typing speed is approximately 40 words per minute, that means you got to spend 45 minutes of pure writing. Can you do that? I don't know. A 60,000 word novel at 30 days would be 2,000 words per day, 50 minutes of writing. 90,000 words would be 3,000 words per day at 75 minutes of writing. 110,000 words at 30 days would be 3,666 words per day at 92 minutes of writing. Now, can you write 40 words per minute constantly for all that time? Yes and no. You might have some minutes where you write a lot more and some where you write less. So those times should be considered just guidelines. The strategies that you can follow to write an entire book in 30 days you need to set aside time every day to write. If you can't make it that day, then write more before or after to make up for it. I personally like to start the novel on a day that I know I can write a lot more than I need to, so I get ahead. You need to keep your weekly total. Getting ahead for breathing room can relieve some stress. When you're writing, you should cut out distractions. Keep your phone out of the office. Turn off your ringer. Tell the kids to leave you alone. Whatever you have to do to focus. Don't stop for writer's block. If you don't know what you're going to write, you can skip ahead. You can write something else. You can just keep writing. But write something every day. Don't get caught in the moment where you don't write. If you want to do this in 30 days, you have to do it every day. Don't get worried as to whether or not what you're writing is good. If you're really stuck, go back to your outline and theme. It might give you just the spark you need. Keep notes about what you want to add in or change as you go, but don't get too worried about that. You can parse out some rewards for meeting your goals. If you're a Starbucks junkie, maybe you only get Starbucks if you make your daily or weekly total. At the end of a successful week, maybe you go out for dinner or when you finish the novel, give yourself a special treat. Buy that thing you've always wanted on Amazon. Something that gives you a reward for doing what you want to do. But don't talk about writing, just do it. People love to talk about how they're writing novels and generally those people don't write as many novels because they're talking about it too much. You have to want to write and you have to write. So there is something called the UG factor. This happens to everybody. At some point in your writing, you're gonna wanna quit. Your brain's gonna say, this sucks or this isn't turning out how I imagined usually around the middle. It can seem so easy to just stop and try again when you think you've got the right inspiration or you got the right idea. But do not quit. Things will turn out. The draft will turn out. Maybe not how you expected, but if you keep working at it, you will finish. You should know that all first drafts usually suck. 
But you can't edit something that you don't finish. You have to finish. Don't worry about comparing yourself to other writers, especially if this is your first book. Have the discipline to work every day, even if only for a few minutes. Keep your long-term goal in mind, but focus on your short-term progress. Incremental work. I have to get these 1,500 words done today. And just focus on that. Don't worry about writing 120,000 words. You know that's the long-term goal, but just focus on this incremental goal and that could help. But you really have to want to finish this. You have to want it. And I don't mean you have to just feel like you want it. You have to want it. You have to say to yourself, I will finish this book, not I want to finish this book or I would, would like to finish this book. You say, I will finish this book. Don't worry about perfection. Just write. Your brain is telling you this book sucks. Well, you know what? Who cares? All first drafts suck. Lots of published work sucks. You can fix it later. If you can identify where it sucks, then you can fix it. But if it's not finished, you can't fix it. I would rather be doing X. Well, you know, supposedly 90% of people say they would like to actually write a novel. And that's great, but talk is cheap. Do you want to write something or you just want to talk about how much you'd like to write something? It's a different mindset. You can say, I would like to write a novel all you want. But until you actually do it, you're not doing it. We've got X or Y to do instead. Well, will you die if you don't do those things? Will somebody else? Will the house burn down? If not, get your words in first, then go check Facebook, then do the dishes, then do the laundry. Whatever it takes, get your words done, especially if you need to do this in 30 days. But to make it easier on yourself, try to structure your writing time to allow for those important tasks so you're not gonna worry about them. So maybe get up an hour earlier each day to work. So you're not panicking about how you don't have time to make supper or don't have time to cut the grass or whatever it is. The story isn't working. Well, finish it first. If you give up because you think it's not working, you're not going to solve anything. You can have more than one draft. You can have one, two, three, five, a hundred drafts. It doesn't matter. But to quit because you don't think it's working doesn't solve anything. Finish the draft first before you decide if it's not working. I don't like the story anymore. Well, you know what? How do you know? You're not done. It might surprise you. Toss something crazy in there if you're getting bored. Maybe take a break, ruminate over a coffee, watch a movie, listen to an album with a notepad handy in the dark. Just think. Just because you can't find the solution right now doesn't mean something won't jog your mind later. The most important part of writing is writing. Anybody can give up. So many people I talk to that say they want to write a novel start writing it and then they give up. They get to that point where it's hard and they quit. I tell them the best feeling in writing comes at the beginning and at the end. You feel so great when you're at the beginning with a fresh pad of paper, so many possibilities. Your idea is there, you can't wait. And then when you're done, hey, I did it. It's amazing, I accomplished something. Everything else can be agony. You'll feel so great when you actually get it done. If something is really not working, you're really having trouble, you can skip that part. Nobody says you have to write this book in order. Jump ahead in the story and continue on from there. Come back to the part that you were stuck at later when things are more illuminated. Maybe you just need to get outside and get a bit of exercise. Go for a run, hop on a bike, get some fresh air. That might just clear your head. Fear is truly the mind killer. Fear of being embarrassed, fear of people laughing at you, fear of your book being terrible and people shunning you. But keep this in mind. Approximately a million new books are released every year on Earth. 99.9% .9 of those are forgotten. Estimates place about 130 million books published in all of human history. And 99.99% .99 of those are forgotten. The average book sells less than 500 copies according to Publishers Weekly. People are reading much less. Those that do read do so in great numbers, but most don't read a thing. The overall percentage of people who read is in decline. That can provide you a sense of anonymity. For me, that can be freeing. Knowing that they're not all going to laugh at you makes you able to just do what you have to do and not worry about people's opinions. So here you go. The world is full of talkers, but few doers. Writing a novel is hard work. You have to want to do it. But it's quite possible if you set your mind to it. 
And when you're done, think of this. You'll have something to tell people at parties. Self-publishing that book is easier than it's ever been. You'll feel like you really accomplished something. And once you get to do it once and realize it won't kill you, figure out the way through it, you're going to want to do it again and again. And each time you'll get better and better and better. Writing is a craft that takes work. And the more you do it, the better you will get at it. Consider this. Walter Gibson, whose pen name was Maxwell Grant, writer of The Shadow, wrote more than 300 pulp novel-length books in the 30s and 40s, often writing more than 10,000 words a day to meet demand. Don Pendleton, creator of The Executioner, started writing at 40 and wrote more than 70 novels before he died at 67. And R.L. Stein has published hundreds of books, at one time writing more than a book a month across multiple series. Writing can be something you do in great quantities. It doesn't have to be the hardest task you've ever gone through. And these people prove that. Now, they came from different worlds where output equaled payment. So in the pulp days, you had to write to get paid. So you couldn't sit around and, oh, I don't feel like it today, or I don't know what I'm writing. You just had to write. And if these guys can do it, if I can do it, so can you. So what's stopping you? Get out there and write a book. If you like this video, please consider checking out my books. Available online at Amazon, Smashwords, Kobo, for Kindle, in stores at McNally Robinson, Chapters, and Indigo, and from our website, ringojones.com. Click like, subscribe to our channel below, and have a nice day.